Okay, we're good. Okay, I'd like to call to the order the February 9th, 2021 meeting of the Dinah Park and Rec Commission. Janet, could you do the roll call, please? Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Nawaski? Here. Commissioner McCauley? Here. Commissioner Darlene? Here. Commissioner Dillstadt? Here. Commissioner Good? Here. Commissioner Nelson? Commissioner Struther? Here. Commissioner Willett? Here. Commissioner Itis? Here. Um, item three, I'd like to ask for the motion and the second to approve the uh, meeting agenda, please. So moved. Second. Janet, could you do the roll call, please? Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Darlene? Aye. Commissioner Delscott? Aye. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner Struther? Commissioner Struther? Aye. Commissioner Willett? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. Thank you. Um, item four, um, I'd ask for the motion and the second to approve uh, the minutes from last month's meeting, please. So moved. Second. Janet, could you do the roll call again, please? Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Darlene? Aye. Commissioner Dostad? Aye. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner Struther? Aye. Commissioner Willett? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. Um, item four on our agenda. I think I'll let Gary do uh, the beginning, please. Thank you, Chair Itis, members of the commission. Uh, just a few quick um, reminders as we head into this uh, virtual meeting tonight, uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, when possible, please uh, leave your camera on unless you're having uh, bandwidth issues or, um, or other issues as we're um, explained tonight by members who are multitasking with children. Uh, reminder to uh, when you're not speaking, try to mute your audio, um, speak feedback. Um, please use the chat function if you're having any technical difficulty. Uh, when we do take votes tonight, obviously we'll use the roll call uh, order. And then just a reminder, we are meeting virtually in compliance with Governor uh, Wall's executive order this night, tonight. So um, we do have three um, uh, report items um, for you this evening. Um, the first is a uh, update on the Senior Center and the Senior Center activities. Uh, then we'll have a stormwater and water management plan update, and then your annual election of officers. So to begin, I'd like to introduce Nicole Gorman. Uh, Nicole is a recreation supervisor with the city of Edina, and uh, she will give you an update on the senior center um, activities and facility and programs that have been going. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Good evening, commissioners. Um, uh, as Perry said, I'm overseeing the Dinah Senior Center and we have been closed since March 13th of last year. And with that closure, we have been trying to offer alternative programming for our participants, including virtual offerings. Um, we did team up with the library and community education last year to offer a pen pal program that was intergenerational. We ended up serving 300 and was it 340 participants in that program um, and then we have been doing some drive-through events and those have been very successful we actually have one this Friday and another one next Tuesday they have been at capacity or um, full with wait lists and so we're going to continue to offer those as we start to um, phase in limited in-person programming which will be starting in March 
Uh, we are bringing a few programs back, but because of the executive orders and the capacity limits, we are only able to bring back um, about 12 people into our banquet space at a time. So we are slowly reintroducing programs and then hopefully by summer we'll be able to amp up our offerings. Um, in April and May, we will be bringing back exercise classes. And then um, we'll be continuing to do the virtual offerings as well as the drive-throughs for those who are not comfortable with coming back to the facility, but also as a way for us to reach a broader audience. Um, and then just trying to get the facility back up and ready to reopen. Short and sweet. Uh, Nicole, would you want me to just highlight some of the uh, facility improvements that you oversaw? Well, it was closure. It was kind of the double piece of that, right? Uh, we were closed due to Hennepin County's facility work, but then there was also some internal work that was done. Yes, so we ended up um, removing the flooring out of the fireside room, the grand view room, the hallways, um, the lobby, the front office, and um, receptionist area. And then we also painted the entire facility and we are getting new banquet tables for the fireside room. Um, and that was a much needed mini facelift that I am very grateful for. So. I apologize, my children, if you can hear them, they are downstairs, but they are quite loud. <laughs> Say, hey, Nicole, this is Greg Good. Could you give us an example of a couple of the drive through events that you hosted that were so popular? Of course. So in November, we hosted our first one, which was a resource drive through event. And we partnered with 40 organizations who provided us with resources that were, um, you know, relevant to the aging demographic. And we also had these organizations, they provided us with prizes to hand out. We had um, the police there as um, to help us with the event. And we actually um, hosted it at the Braemar Golf Course parking lot because we our parking lot was closed with construction and all of the dumpsters and everything. So, and our parking lot is rather small. If you've been to the senior center, <laughs> there's not really a lot of space to do um, big events like that. We ended up serving 150 vehicles. Um, and some of those vehicles had multiple people in them from the same household. And then our next event we did at the Aquatic Center parking lot, and it was, I think, a thankful for you drive through event. And we had 75 people for that event. And then we did a holiday one, um, and that had 75. We're doing a Valentine's drive through this Friday, and we have 85 registered for that. And then Tuesday, we're doing a Mardi Gras drive through. And hmm. right now we're at about 50 for that drive through. Still room for the Mardi Gras, huh? Yes, there is. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for Nicole? I'd also like to thank Nicole. Um, obviously, working at the senior center, that, um, through the pandemic, that was a high risk population. So we took um, every available precaution we could, uh, not only high risk, but by nature, a very social group. So we had two opposing forces working against us there. Um, so as we look to reopen, a number of uh, improvements have been made. Also like to thank Nicole during um, the closure. Um, she also helped out with a number of other a variety of programs, our activity boxes, a lot of our end, uh, events, uh, uh, Chalk the Walk event in Centennial Lakes, um, all of the Yeti programs. So really explored a lot of opportunity as well as help MJ Lamont, especially on volunteer coordination and resource allocation early on in the pandemic. Uh, Nicole was kind of our parks and recreation liaison with our other departments. So she played a number of, uh, wore a number of hats during, during the pandemic. <clears throat> Any other other comments? Nicole? Yeah, thanks a lot, Nicole. It's a great presentation. It's nice to have guests and learn more about uh, the park system. Certainly. 
Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Um, if nothing else, we'll move on to item 5B, and that is an update on the uh, intersection of water resources with uh, park, uh, park resources as well. I'd like to introduce Jessica Wilson. Jessica is the uh, water resources coordinator for the city of Edina. She uh, resides in the engineering department, who we, we tend to work closely with. And she'll be giving you a, a presentation tonight on the management techniques for water within our parks and kind of an overall view. And um, I will turn it over to Jessica. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, I'm here, I'm joined by Ross Bittner, the engineering services manager in the engineering department. And we're gonna talk today about water resources management and how the engineering department and parks department work together and to layer in services for the community. I, we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish in park spaces for water resources and natural resources, and then as well as recreation opportunities, and really excited for some future opportunities. And then uh, also really grateful to be able to share this story with this group. So I want to start off by setting the stage for the strategic harmony that we have between the park strategic plan related to natural resources. Within that plan, uh, it identifies opportunities to protect, enhance, and restore the city's natural resources and natural areas, create more resilient and sustainable parks, facilities, and landscapes, and protect and restore Edina's water resources. In our water resources management plan, which is housed in the engineering oh. department, it's our plan that focuses on flood protection and clean water services. In that plan, we identify public streets, open spaces, and public parks as places to manage flood risk and build or incorporate clean water facilities. So there's a lot of overlap and a lot of opportunity to uh, leverage the work that we're doing for clean water and flood protection and use that as an opportunity to renew and enhance some of those park features, especially when um, uh, one of those tends to be a little bit, um, has a, a, a funding source, I'll say, and the other one um, can benefit from that. So I wanna give you a couple examples of past projects where we've really collaborated to incorporate those flood protection and clean water benefits with the, uh, layering in those, those park and recreation benefits. I'll give you a couple of examples of success stories and what we've learned and what's really valuable valuable about those. Uh, and then a couple of projects that we're, we're currently working on in like a concept development or a design stage, and then where we see some opportunities in the future. And then um, also take some time to pause and react to um, uh, take your questions and your reactions. So one story I wanna share is for uh, related to Braemar Golf Course. So the Academy Nine course and driving range was reconstructed in 2015 and 2016, and the main course was reconstructed between 2016 and 2018. And really, at the outset, a, a goal of that project was not only to enhance playability of the golf course, um, but also to incorporate some natural resources along the way. So here uh, is kind of like a before and after picture. So there was a lot of uh, flooding and poor drainage before the construction project. It, uh, the golf course lacked a wetland buffer. There was a high density of invasive species, so things like um, buckthorn, purple turf, reed canary grass, cattails, lots of turf, which is high maintenance, uh, has a high maintenance burden, and there was a lack of natural areas. Post-construction, a lot was done um, to provide flood storage and establish wetland buffers manage invasive species, convert turf to prairie where there's space available, establish oak savanna and create wetland. And these are really goals that were established at the outset of a project. So it really was key to the design from the beginning. So Derek Daschle is a senior ecologist with SEH and he gave a presentation to the city council in December of 2019. And I've put a screenshot of his cover page here so you can go back if you want. Um, it's about a 15 minute presentation that he gives to the city council and he's a really engaging speaker. I encourage you to check it out. And they've also uh, captured some drone footage, which is a really cool way to take a look at a natural resources project. So what I've done is I've taken a subset of Derek's presentation and some images that I wanted to share with you today. This is not his whole presentation, but some key images that I thought really told the story well. 
So here's the, the pre-construction condition. There were flooding issues throughout the park, uh, poor drainage, reduced playability or impact of the times that the course could be open, a lack of wetland buffers. So here you see there, there was mowing straight to the edge of the water. Invasive species, this is purple loosestrife, aggressive invasive plant that can take over wetland areas especially and create that monoculture of a, an invasive and aggressive plant. Poor water quality, these are all these pre-construction conditions, lots of turf, a high maintenance burden for that. There's a lot of inputs, fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation that are required to maintain turf. Natural areas also need to be maintained, but the inputs are uh, smaller and uh, uh, less harmful for the environment. So in the end, post-construction, the value that was added with that project by keeping water resources and natural resources in mind from the outset was uh, an additional uh, flood storage was created. This pond in the Academy 9 course was expanded and it provides a uh, clean water benefit. Flooding was directed to non-playable areas, so improved drainage. Wetland buffers were established. There's a lot of good looking native plants here, bee balm and black-eyed Susan. This is a wetland uh, that was created and really uh, we even got some uh, additional what we call incidental wetlands just because the conditions were so great for wetland creation there so we allowed for more of that and we actually exceeded the uh, the regulatory requirement for how much wetland we needed to create or mitigate restored oak savanna this is pretty early on in the restoration so the plants are really really small you can imagine this area filled with buckthorn was the pre-construction condition so here now you can actually see some very nice specimen trees and oak trees that now have an opportunity to thrive and this understory now is open to sunlight that would allow for for an oak savanna plant community to thrive and here's some more pictures of that established uh, Oak Savannah, this is really early after it was planted in its first or second year of establishment. Native plantings often in their first few years of establishment might look a little bit fuzzy or a little bit ugly and they really start to reach their full beauty in years four and five and at the Academy 9 we're in years five and six now of maintenance so it's starting to look really really beautiful. Restored native prairie, here's some signs that let people know that this is a, a restoration area. And this is a little bit up higher on the hill on the Academy 9 side. And there were some nice little pockets of existing um, native vegetation, which we were kind of surprised to see. Most of the site was really in poor condition, but there were a couple patches far off from the playable areas that was looking okay. And this is one of those areas. We can see a nice specimen oak tree here and an open, understory. Here's another look at this wetland that was created. These posts around kind of uh, outline the, the boundary of that wetland that was created. Here's a more of that native prairie that was established in areas where they weren't really playable areas but just areas that were being maintained as turf which you can imagine has that high maintenance burden especially that that um, premier turf that you see at golf courses. And then it was an opportunity to let people in on the story and what we were doing there and the benefits that we were providing for native plants, pollinator habitat, water quality, wetland benefits that include flood storage and flood risk reduction. So a couple sum summary slides of the things that we were able to do at the Academy 9 course. Um, here's some quantities on the flood storage, 7.7 .7 acre feet more of storage in a flood event, eight fewer acres of turf, and that's all those inputs that would go along with that to maintain that turf. Uh, 6.2 acres added of oak savanna and 7.4 acres added of native prairie. For the main course, 18 whole course, another uh, 0.77 acre feet of storage was added. 18.22 acres of wetland buffer was added, uh, exceeding the requirement that the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District had. And then 29.77 acres 
was added for prairie and oak savanna and none of that was a regulatory requirement that was something that we did because it supported those overarching goals of better use utilizing that open space and enhancing it back to uh, so that we could realize some of those benefits of natural resource restoration so this is what the academy wetland looked like before this looks kind of like that area in a backyard that's always wet and kind of a pain to maintain turf uh, so this is really suitable soil for wetland and was a, a great place to restore that wetland so this is a before picture you can see this invasive purple loosestrife in the background mowed turf and this kind of wet soggy area that was difficult to mow and maintain as turf and then during construction it looks a little bare it was uh, and then the academy wetland now filled with native plants and this one is actually uh in its sixth year now and so it's got some nice mature plants it's in this kind of perpetual maintenance mode now and it's out of that establishment period so it's looking really really beautiful and these are um, some some really great healthy uh, indicators of good health for wetland plants and and some really beneficial pollinator species as well. The main course, this is what the wetland looked like before. This is purple loosestrife, that invasive plant. This yellow plant is also invasive. There's some burdock here that's invasive. Uh, nothing really good here from a vegetation standpoint. There's some cattails in the background and then mowed turf all the way to the edge. And this is what this wetland looks like during construction. It was super wet in 2019. And then this is what the main course wetland looks like now. So you can start to see some of those plants that are native. This is Black Eyed Susan popping up. Still a lot of cattails, so we're actively working on knocking those back. So wetland accomplishments, uh, we added um, several acres, or, uh, uh, 0.11 acres and 0.37 uh, acres were impacted. Uh, we had so many acres that we were required to mitigate and then the acres that we actually provided uh, in some areas uh, exceeded what was required. We had some incidental wetlands at the Academy 9. So we got some additional credits for that. I'm going to go back now to um, my slide deck. Um, so I think Braemar Golf Course is an example of uh, really marrying those flood protection and water resource resources, but also those park amenities and park assets. And it's really a layering in. So one doesn't take away from the other. Um, they can layer in and we can really get multiple benefits out of working together, especially when we start early and have a, a common set of goals. Another example, a, a success story that I want to share is Arden Park. So that one we started, we had much more, uh, uh, a lot of uh, public engagement associated with that project. And we were able to um, add some clean water benefit. We have some uh, stormwater facilities that remove 30 pounds of phosphorus annually. We had some habitat improvements, and I think of the ones that are in the stream, removing the dam, re-meandering the stream, which is just a fancy word for adding those uh, twists and bends back into the stream, and then stabilizing the stream bank. And then we have those more like uh, on the land habitat improvements, adding hundreds of new trees, buckthorn and ash removal, and then a lot of vegetation that invites pollinators. Uh, and then because we we're in there working in that space, that's a big opportunity to renew those park amenities, including the shelter, playground, hockey rink, trails, and boardwalk. I think for parks and for water resources, really, we really want to create spaces in nature that people want to be in, uh, and so they can form a connection with those resources. So here's some pictures of this new stream alignment, the shelter building in the background, a nice bridge crossing and, uh, that connects trails and loops, and then a, a photo of the stormwater inf infiltration swale on the right. Stabilized shorelines with access points. Again, I think this is such a, a, a clear overlap with water resources management and uh, with parks. We really want people to be able to access and enjoy these features. A couple other smaller scale projects that I want to introduce you to, and then I'll, I'll show you a couple of things that are perspective or we're in the design phase. The Lake Cornelia shoreline buffer restoration, this was built 
uh, mostly in 2020, and now we've got a maintenance tail for the next few years as we get through this establishment period, and then it will be perpetually maintained after that. There's a Better Together site if you want to track the story of uh, installation. And this has uh, park amenities like benches and a wood chip trail that adds a nice, now you can take a nice walk through the neighborhood and form a loop walking along Lake Cornelia on the south side. Uh, and then it has those uh, natural resources benefits, some pollinator habitat, and then those water quality benefits by having a restored shoreline that can help or help buffer some of those pollutants. It's probably not a huge clean water benefit, but there's a nice overlap there between parks and access and uh, pollinator habitat. Melody Lake Shoreline Restoration Project. This is one that's going to be starting probably uh, definitely sometime this month, maybe even uh, this next week with some buckthorn removal. This is a rendering of what we are, uh, uh, what our design uh, goal is to restore this area, which today is mostly turf and some invasive species along the shoreline, uh, like reed canary grass and, and buckthorn are big problems here. So it would be removing those invasive aggressive species and restoring it back to native and also creating some spaces for people to access the lake so that they can enjoy it and form a connection with that special place. So that's a 2021 project. We have a Better Together page there too. And that's one where we were engaging with the neighborhood and we used some of their feedback to change our design. We learned through the process that this was a popular spot for sledding. And that's something that we can accommodate and just kind of shift our management approach just a little bit to make sure that we can maintain that uh, um, uh, space and that, that use in the neighborhood and then still also um, add in these other benefits of native plants and a shoreline restoration. And then just a list of some other things we're doing at Fire Station One. This isn't a park property per se, but it's a public space where um, they've transitioned from turf to um, natural landscaping. So it's either a, a bee lawn or native plantings. They don't have any turf anywhere left on site. It's a really great example of a, like a residential scale full site conversion. They also have bees and they do composting there. So they're, they're working on some really cool stuff there. Nine Mile Creek Shoreline Restoration, that was a partnership with the Watershed District where they did a lot of work to correct some erosion issues in the stream bank and then also restored some of the vegetation back to um, native. So again, not a, really a designated park, but still city owned open space where we can add some of that natural resources value back in. Uh, city Council approved a pollinator friendly resolution. And then we're doing a lot of buckthorn management at our priority parks for buckthorn management, which are Pamela Park, Bredesen Park, and Braemar Park. So we've made a lot of headway at Pamela Park in particular with the help of a really enthusiastic, committed volunteer group. Uh, and then we also have some volunteers that are doing some really good work at Bredesen Park and chipping away at that one. That one's really a huge buckthorn removal um, a project. So they're kind of ticking away and peeling the onion there at Bredesen Park. And we're getting involved too to help make sure that the progress that they make uh, remains and then we can continue to advance that there. Uh, and then Braemar Park, huge strides were made with that golf course uh, reconstruction. And we think there's more areas to continue to kind of peel the onion or, or get further at Braemar Park also. So this is what natural resources installation and maintenance looks like just a little bit. There's some um, turf removal often, um, invasive species removal. There's a picture here of some buckthorn brushing. Buckthorn is something, it's a, a long-term commitment if you decide you wanna do some buckthorn busting or buckthorn brushing. It's not a one-time thing. Um, usually it's in that first year taking out those uh, more mature plants and then it's, uh, multi-year process. It can take five years to really get a handle on a space that has been heavily infested with buckthorn and for a long time. So we're committed to making those uh, uh, investments so that that initial investment, which is big to remove it, that we can protect that investment by committing to perpetually maintaining those areas. And over time, the maintenance costs get smaller and smaller as those natural or native um, plants get reestablished. 
um, some plug planting. That's a way to get a little bit of a head start with your plants is to plant them as plugs. Uh, bee lawn seeding, this was at the fire station. It was a pretty small scale project, so they could do that by hand and then they hay over the top to protect those seeds as they, as they germinate. And then controlled burns, that's a pretty common management technique and a really cost effective way to knock back invasive species to spur the, the um, germination and development of natural uh, native plants, which are used to that kind of disturbance and they, they can, uh, they're pretty resilient in fire. So I wanna walk you through a few projects that we're kind of right in the mix of right now. And I wanna get your reaction and, um, but this is kind of an introduction to kind of how we're thinking of, of uh, looking at uh, this one's particularly flood risk reduction and how we can uh, leverage park space to provide that flood risk reduction benefit and then also do some enhancement of park areas. So this is our Morningside Flood Infrastructure Project and it would impact Weber Park. We have a Better Together page two here if you wanna follow along with kind of how we got to where we're at right now. This is something that we're gonna be bringing to city council sometime this spring is our kind of concept design and next steps for, for going further into design. So this is the Morningside neighborhood and you can see Weber Park there in the upper right. This map is showing in blue areas that are at flood risk during a 1% annual chance flood event. That's also called a 100 year flood or a one in 100 chance flood of happening each year. That would be about seven and a half inches in a 24 hour period. So as we're going through um, uh, the technical evaluation of what's possible here, what, what can we physically accomplish from an engineering standpoint? And then also, bringing the public through that process to say, what do you value about this space? What do you desire for a future of this space? What problems need to be fixed? What can you support uh, for um, uh, infrastructure changes in this neighborhood? So it's a combination of what's, what's um, technically feasible, what's, what can be accomplished, um, also with what is gonna be supported by the neighborhood. So we looked at various options. Also in this map, you can see those uh, yellow circles and orange lines that represents our stormwater network. So catch basins, manholes, and pipes underground. So we looked at a few things in with uh, flood risk management, you can either store water somewhere, you can hold it somewhere, uh, you can move it somewhere else, or you can reduce the vulnerability of structures in that space by moving them up and out of a flood area. So when we're looking at technically what's possible here from uh, how much value can we add by doing an infrastructure project, how much risk or flood damage can we reduce? We looked at options that included pipes, increased storage, surface overflow, so planning where water's gonna flow over the surface, ponds and pumping, and then combinations of those various things. So I'm gonna go through these kind of uh, quickly and just uh, focus on the impacts to the parks part of the story. So we looked at storage options and we are looking just in public spaces. Weber Pond over here on the right, in its current uh, form, it's this kind of rectangular shape. It's a constructed stormwater pond. And we're looking at options to expand Weber Pond and then also expand this inundation area that's between Lynn and Kipling. We're calling this the Lynn Kipling inundation area. And the, the least expensive way, the, the best like cost benefit uh, uh, analysis shows that if we take some surface features that already exist, Weber Pond and this inundation area, for example, and we can expand them, then we can provide a lot of flood storage benefit relatively cheaply. Other ways to store water would be things like putting it in big underground vaults, that gets really expensive really quickly, you know, or creating brand new ponds, that is also relatively more expensive than taking an existing feature and making it bigger, uh, either expanding it uh, outward or downward, making it deeper and lowering the water level. A couple other things we looked at, but which we're, we're not really investigating a whole lot further is 
uh, space at a Vail Academy or Susan Lindgren School, adding some storage there. Those final recommendation that we're going to make to council. But Weber Pond and Lynn Kipling Inundation Area, those we see as really exciting opportunities to provide a lot of flood benefit relative to cost. The other thing that we looked at, which it's probably not going to make it into our final recommendation, but I wanted to share with the, um, the park board, is looking at the fields in Weber Park. Weber park. Uh, it's possible to have fields that are uh, able to store flood water, and they can be designed in a way where you can accommodate a certain amount of flood water. And of course, that risk tolerance has to be decided um, with help with uh, the public and also engineers to determine what's uh, what's physically possible, and then that value determination is made. Um, but it's possible to store water under fields or on fields, and then perhaps, you know, if it's a one in five year or one in 10 year event, if there's some damage to that field, but we were able to protect so much damage to structures, is that a benefit? Uh, that is that a trade-off that the neighborhood is willing to support? Um, that, there wasn't a whole lot of benefit or value add by doing that, so that probably won't make it into our final recommendation, but that's kind of an example of a way that we're looking at park spaces where we can use it as a field, a playing field, and in those more extreme events, can it provide a little bit of flood protection value also. So uh, we're also looking at adding some pipes to convey water or route water more effectively. There's a whole list here. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I really want to focus on the park impacts for this group, um, but really it's all about conveying water more effectively. So there's those storage options, making those ponds bigger and deepening them and lowering the water level so there's just more room to hold flood water during that event. And then there's things like managing where water overflows and we can be more strategic and manage where water flows during a flood event so you can see here in the middle of the park there's a swale here which we can design to help direct water to a proper place uh, to reduce damage to nearby structures so we looked at various scales of implementation for this and some of them um, are are kind of foundational in nature. If we're going to do anything for a flood infrastructure project in the Morningside neighborhood, the expansion of Weber Pond and that inundation area seem foundational to getting big enough to provide, um, to, to scaling to the problem, to, to providing value. So those options are shown in this red check mark. That's kind of our good option, like the bare minimum things that we, we, we would recommend to make a difference here for flood protection. So impacts to the park, that includes expanding those inundation areas that we already have, the areas that are already wet. If we wanted to go further, we would add in this swale in through Weber Park and uh, uh, more conveyance to get water to flow safely to Weber Park. So that also is something that we think is gonna make it into our final recommendation. And then there are some things if you wanted to go really extreme, really big, spend a lot of money, uh, you would explore some of those other options for adding storage at Avail Academy, Susan Lindgren School, storage of water under fields. We don't think that that has enough, provides enough value for the cost to make it into our final recommendation. But again, just wanna give you an example of ways that we're thinking about using park spaces to layer in some, some flood risk reduction management. So if we were to summarize the difference between those options, with our existing status quo option, uh, if we were just going to come in and, and do, uh, there's a street reconstruction project coming up in 2022 and 2023, which is why we're looking at this area. So if you're also wondering, why Weber Park, why now? We have a big investment opportunity coming up with a street reconstruction project. So we're trying to get ahead of that design process to say, what could we do here to provide some flood risk reduction benefit? Let's get a concept idea in mind as we jump into that construction design process. So if we were to go in and just update our stormwater infrastructure as a status quo, um, uh, thing, we wouldn't have any structures removed from risk or any that would have a reduced level of risk. We'd still spend some money to do our regular reinvestment and renewal of existing infrastructure. 
uh, but we wouldn't provide any value for flood risk reduction. Um, but it is the cheapest option. The do nothing option uh, is, is cheaper as far as um, uh, city budget. I don't know, there's still gonna be some damage to structures if they would be flooded. Uh, and then in that next step option, that good benefit, uh, the size of a project um, is kind of that big relative to bigger or biggest. And we can remove a handful of structures from risk. We can reduce risk at 106 structures and we can calculate how much damage would be reduced by doing a project of that size. Um, the cost is starts around this $5 million mark, and there's some trade-offs and opportunities. If we expanded Weber Pond, there's a lot of mature trees in that Weber Woods area, and a lot of trees would have to be removed on the, on the order of four to six acres of trees removed. Um, we think that there's an opportunity to really enhance the natural areas that remain after we do a pond expansion. The quality of the park um, is pretty low as far as the, the tree community there, the natural resources community. On a scale of A, B, C, D, kind of like an academic scale where A is the best and D is the worst, it's a D. Uh, on the border of non-native uh, is kind of the last, um, the, is, is the bottom for, for a quality ranking. Uh, if we go to like a better flood risk reduction benefit, a little bit bigger project, we see more structures removed or reduced risk, better, um, a, a better job at reducing uh, annual damages to private structures. It costs a little bit more. Those trade-offs and opportunities are still related to trees and park space, but would be more expansive. And then the best, biggest option, we start to see some diminishing returns in structures removed or risk removed and annualized benefit, much more cost. And then those benefits, uh, trade-offs and opportunities remain the same. We don't think that we're gonna get to this best, biggest uh, range when we make our staff recommendation. We think it's gonna be somewhere between this good and better range. Really what we wanna show is the benefit that we can, uh, that can accumulate for the neighborhood by doing a flood risk reduction project in the park space, and then also the trade-offs by working in that park space, and then the uh, opportunities. I have a few more slides about this project, and then I'll pause, because I've given you so much meat to chew on, and I wanna check in with you and see if you have any questions. So this is our uh, modeling to show what we think would happen in these various size storms and under various scenarios that we can kind of plug into the model. So this is an existing condition. This is the Morningside neighborhood and we've cut it in half because it doesn't, the Morningside neighborhood is, uh, it doesn't fit nicely on a presentation slide. So here's the Northern part of the neighborhood. Here's Weber Park and Weber Pond. And you can see all the structures, um, well, I should say the, the blue areas, the darker the blue, the deeper the water. And then for structures, if it's a grayed out outline, there's no risk. And then if it has uh, this uh, coloring from a lighter orange to a darker orange, that is relative to risk. So the lighter the color, the lowest risk of flood uh, damage, and the darker the orange color, the higher the risk. So you can see a lot of structures between this Grimes and Kipling that have some coloring, some areas in the southern part of the neighborhood along Branson. Um, and what is this? Grimes, Kipling, Lynn? Someone can correct me later. Uh, where we have more coloring of structures that are at risk. So this is what we would, we would expect in the, under the existing conditions if we were to have what's called a 50 year storm, which is about 6.4 inches over a 24 hour period. So with that good option, just expanding Weber Pond, expanding that inundation area, and then working a little bit on conveyance to get water to those spaces more intentionally, we can see some how homes that are re removed from at risk, so they would be in green, or the total risk is reduced. So they go from a darker orange color to a lighter orange color, and we can quantify that dam that reduction in potential damage to those structures, we can quantify that and look at it from like a, a cost benefit standpoint. So if I flip back and forth a little bit between these, you can see how the colors change a little bit as some of those structures are removed from risk and then other cases, the risk 
is reduced. So this isn't that good option, expanding those surface features that already hold water and making them work a little bit harder to store even more. In this better option, this is a big expansion of uh, into the Weber Woods area. So like I said, a, a big um, effort to remove a lot of trees. We know that that's a really beloved space. We've heard that from people, that they use that space for dog walking and just getting out into nature, especially over the last year, people have really um, been grateful for spaces like that, that they can get out to and enjoy nature. Um, but we think that's also a big opportunity to reinvest and renew, especially in those natural resources there and add some value. Uh, and this better option, there's that swale you can see built in through Weber Field to get that uh, water more effectively to the pond. And then this best option, the most uh, extreme option has some storage up higher in the watershed and some other pipe options to convey water. I won't spend much time on this option because I don't think we'll get to this level for our staff recommendation. So I wanna pause because I've given you so much to think about and contemplate. I'm more than halfway through my, my talk, but I wanna check in and see if you have any reactions or questions or comments at this point. Jessica, can we go back pre-Weber a minute for some questions? Yeah. Or do you want to have them all at the end or? Um, um, it's up to you. Um, I've got, just, go ahead. I've got just a few more. Maybe we'll just get through the end and then we can okay. have this conversation. Yeah, we'll wait then. Sure. Okay. We can we can wait. These are pretty short. I'll get through them and then uh, we'll capture those those thoughts and questions at the end. Um, something else that we are in um, the design phase on is at Roslyn Park. So this is Lake Cornelia and Lake Cornelia is not meeting water quality goals. It's on the uh, impaired waters list, which is a federal list of water resources throughout the nation that are not meeting water quality standards. And so local communities then are compelled to do projects to improve water quality. So not only is it just on this impaired waters list with whatever that means, uh, we know that it's not meeting the, the standards of the community and the neighborhood. There's been some harmful algal blooms over the last several years and algae blooms uh, in general, and people just want uh, Lake Cornelia to be healthier anyway. So there's an opportunity here to take water as it flows through swimming pool pond here on the north side of that Roslyn Park parking lot, well, north and east side, and to treat it before that water makes its way into Lake Cornelia. And so we're looking at designing a vault somewhere in the park space uh, where we can take that water in, treat it, remove some phosphorus, that, that pollutant that fuels algae blooms, and then put cleaner water back in to Lake Cornelia. So we're looking at that, that um, option and also talking a lot with the, the parks department to say, you know, what, what's the use of this park space? Um, how do we, we work in harmony with the, the goals of the parks department so that we're not impacting, uh, so, so at least that we fully realize the trade-offs and opportunities at this space. We know that this is a popular spot for disc golf that happens in this northern part and that this parking lot gets heavily used for this, um, the uh, aquatic center. So we wanna make sure that anything that we propose there is in harmony with the parks goals and any trade-offs that need to be made, we're full uh, aware of those trade-offs and make that decision uh, upfront. Uh, another option, this is something that was identified as a, another clean water opportunity and also some flood protection opportunity is this Linmar Basin. So to orient you, this is Cornelia Elementary School on the west side. Here's France Avenue all the way on the east side, 70th Street on the top. And at this Linmar Basin, this is a, a, a park space that's already utilized for stormwater management and flood protection. We think there's an opportunity to make this space work harder for that and provide more value for that. Um, and then also enhance it as a park space 
uh, this would be a, a water quality benefit for Lake Cornelia and that downstream Lake Edina. So we're looking at that space. We're kind of in the early, you know, I don't know that we, Ross can maybe uh, fill in on this one a little bit later, but I think we're just starting to kind of develop that strategy for how to approach the neighborhood with what we want to do here. This one's pretty early on. Uh, and we're also working with the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District to, to think about what is possible there. So that's all I have. Uh, and I'll, I'll pause now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I can always pull it back up if folks want to revisit something. And maybe I'll check in with Ross too. Ross, is there anything you wanted to add on as we get into a conversation about? I'd only add that the Rosalind and Linmar uh, proposals are going to be led by the watershed district. So we have an agreement with them already on Rosalind. They're in design. Linmar is still just uh, something that they've, they've studied and that they want to look further into, but we don't have an agreement yet. And Ross and Jessica, I'll just add that on the Rosalind concept, the Parks Commission did review that a while ago. I'm not going to put a mm -hmm number of months on it, but that was early on in that stage of concept. Yeah, Chair, I've got a couple questions I'd offer up. Okay, go ahead, Greg. Um, first, uh, maybe on Braemar, Jessica, I mean, clearly Braemar is a wonderful result from all the work done there and uh, appreciate your presentation on it. Uh, clearly the water management effort had a big part to play. I must admit, I think I've probably left uh, more than a few sleeves ball in the balls in the new prairie grass <laughs> acres. So I'm not overly pleased with that, but it looks beautiful. Um, a question on the wetlands. Uh, when we created those additional wetlands, was there any action around creating a wetland bank? Because that was a big part of what we did, or at least in our master plan with, uh, with Fred Richards. So I'm just wondering what the result of that as an opportunity would have been. Yeah, we have some credits that are kind of just floating out in space right now. It's not officially in a bank, but the idea is that if we were to do uh, more work in that space in the relatively near future, that we could use those credits, so to speak, in a future project. There's some kind of constraints about, you know, it can't be something that's like 20 years down the road. It's got to be something that's a little bit more immediate. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's... Uh, and Perry and Tom might be able to speak to that a little bit more, but yeah, there's some some credits that are hanging out there right now um, that could be utilized to meet a, a regulatory requirement if more work were to happen at Raymar. Yeah, and, and in fact, when we looked at it at Fred Richards, it was both for that as an opportunity and also could be traded for monetary value if somebody else needed those acres, if you would, right? So. We looked at it in the FRED as being possible source of funding for us to do work at FRED by creating that wetland bank. So I just wondered if that was a potential option with what we've done at the at Braemar. Yep, and I think, uh, Perry, do you have any sense of kind of what, what direction you guys are going with that? If it's going to be a, a monetary exchange or a future project, is it way too early to even say? Uh, you might have a better sense for, for that. Yeah, Commissioner Good. One of the things we're actually looking at right now is uh, Joe Abood is looking into, can we continue the cart paths around? So uh, hole 11, hole 7, so when we do have rain days, we can go cart path only, because right now that is an issue for us, is to, to make a circuit around the course. That'll help us uh, not just protect the course, but also um, uh, help facilitate for ADA days as well on rain issues. The other piece to that project too, um, one of the goals is to add a walking bridge on 16. Um, mm -hmm. So if you know coming off of the fairway to connect to the green instead of for walkers to help speed up play. Um, so we're looking into those. We do imagine that those will require some sort of offset with those credits. We're not exactly sure what. And then I think once we do that, um, we feel fairly comfortable that that would probably close out what we view as the, the final improvements to the course for this phase. And then we can look at what's the future of those credits um, of what might be available. Okay, good. Thanks, Perry. And, and then Jessica on the Weber Park, a lot of good information there. Uh, and I'll have to go back to the uh, 
better together site and look through that again. But one thought I had thinking about your comparison, your cost benefit comparison that you had of good, better, best. And, and if I, you know, I don't live in the neighborhood, so I don't have the same empathy or full empathy with those that have to live and deal with the water all the time. But if I just looked at it from a hard kind of cost benefit, I struggled a bit to think, okay, from $5 million to get to good, then to $10 million to get to benefit, and we get a $70,000 benefit from that, which, uh, okay, there's, there's maybe there's some other soft benefits that could still be, you know, telling the story a little bit better there. But when you got to what you call best, another $5 million to just get a $9,000 benefit, I struggled to see a real connection with that at all. Right. I just, uh, again, I don't live in the neighborhood, so I'm sure residents would say, yeah, but if it takes my house out of play, I'm all for it. But, you know, kind of adding another 5 million bucks and just getting $9,000 of identified cost savings or benefits was a real struggle for me just looking at the information. So just some feedback on maybe there's some additional soft benefits to tell that story better if you really think that's a best option, um, but just some feedback on what I saw. Sure. Yep. And I, I think we were also going to be refining that a little bit more. We just have a, a technical memo that we just posted with a little bit more of that. So I think, yeah, that, that I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I take that feedback. Thank you. Yep. yep. Uh, Jessica, I have a couple questions. Um, on the controlled burn, um, what time of year do you do that? And, uh, uh, do you have any plans for any at the golf course? I know I've I've heard that in certain areas. Um, I'm just curious about those two things. Mm -hmm. And if done, you did it in the yeah, if you did it in the summertime, how do you how do you do that around some park uh, or the golf course uh, that's so busy at that time? Mm -hmm. uh, it's common to do them in the spring uh, or the fall. You've got to get to a point with the natural restoration that you have enough like like fuel or material. So they typically, you wait a couple years before you do it if you have a brand new restoration. We have some burns planned at Braemar Park. Tom might be able to have the more kind of the schedule question uh, answers to that. I think they anticipated doing some last fall, but then with weather and COVID and everything that got delayed. Um, but yeah, typically spring or fall, we wanna avoid that mid summer time partly because we don't want to impact play at the field. And then also for things like, um, um, uh, the bat, is that the name? The, the endangered bat species, we haven't identified any in the city of Edina, but typically summertime is when you would try to avoid any big disturbances like that. Tree removals are common to do uh, in like February and March, you can get the best pricing and that's a good time to do that. So uh, if it's, trees it's usually winter time we can even do some burning of that um, but if it's like a prairie burn typically spring tom do you want to comment about raymar plants yeah so our contractor got delayed in the fall uh they had they had a few issues covid was one of them and then we got into the winter time and it get, actually gets too dry the humidity levels got too low so they can't do any of the control burns in the middle of winter so their next best opportunity is in the springtime uh, we'll work with management at the golf course uh, uh, to minimize any, you know, conflicts with the golfers. Uh, and it is, a burn sounds like there's these gigantic flames and it, all kinds of activity going on, but it's really a controlled smolder, I would call it, more than a, than a large active. It, it, so the impacts I perceive will be pretty minor, but we'll work with golf management before we set up the schedule in the spring. Do we contract that out, or who does that work, Tom? Yeah, our, uh, vendor we're using right now is Cardinal, so we it is contracted out, and they uh, they do this regularly throughout the nation. So this is not an unusual item in a park space. Any other questions? Jessica, thank you very much. Is there any other questions uh, um, for any three of them, really? Tom always likes questions.
Yeah, I've got one more, Rick. Jessica, I was thinking yeah. about the uh, impact of the swale that was in your, I think, the better option at uh, Weber Park. Does that, is there any impact to the park space by putting that in there? Does it divide something that it's used for today, open field space? Uh, what would be the impact of kind of having that swale come through, even though it might be less often used, right? I, I understand the intent is one where there's a really heavy rain. It's not like we've created a creek that's running through there, but just wondered what we thought the impact might be. Yeah, and we've talked a little bit about how we might orient some of the amenities that are currently there. So we'd have to make sure we're not impacting the ice rink. Is there an opportunity to move the ice rink? Um, we don't have that level of detail yet. Right now, it's okay. Um, kind of that concept level of if we had a swale here, what could we accomplish in flood risk reduction? I think that next level of detail comes with that next phase of the project, which would be getting a landscape architect on board, really engaging with the neighborhood again to see how do we how do we get something that that works from a recreation standpoint and an aesthetic standpoint and still serves that flood risk reduction purpose. I think what it looks like most days of the year would be. Um, uh, a, a lowered area that could double as a walking path and we could have some some plantings alongside some native plantings and then it would really only be like that kind of creek looking full of water during those those more extreme rain events but yeah i think that level of detail of you know what what trade-offs are we making with features like ice rinks and things that's kind of that next phase but yeah i think we're so far um, trying to think ahead a little bit of you know, what, what does that mean for the ice rink? What does that mean for the parking lot? What what can we move here? What's gonna be impacted? More to okay. come on that. All right, thanks. Uh, Jessica, one more quick note. Um, the sales tax that was discussed in the paper and the proposal, at the, at, I think there was a workshop a year ago that the city council had. Is the Weber work that's discussed in the sales tax uh, items, is that some of the work that you know we've heard tonight then i don't think weber woods was included in a local option sales tax okay. i'm gonna was. check in quick with ross or perry okay it was. okay yeah okay. chair Thanks and commission it was portion of that so it would be okay. um for any portions of those things that impact the park itself or to improve the park upon okay. completion of the story. okay Weber is unique. It's that regional piece of St. Louis Park, Minneapolis, and Edina oh. all compounding in that, that small area. Any other comments or questions for Jessica and Ross and Tom? Uh, Chair, while well, members are thinking, I'll just go back to uh, what Commissioner Good had pointed out, and we do appreciate Ross and Jessica reaching out early on in their uh, Morningside study um, about maybe the direction they're headed, because we understand in parks that there's not a lot of room for stormwater improvements to take place um, outside of city-owned property, so we do understand that that is a logical fit and tie-in. Um, however, what we do appreciate is that if we can work together early, we can improve park amenities during the process to get that function. So um, it doesn't help us either if our athletic fields are flooded for 15 days, um, as well as neighbor's basement. There's no one's winning in that sense. So if we can uh, be involved like this early on in their uh, their concept planning, it's it's a benefit to us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again. Great, uh, thank you, great Jessica. presentation. Thank you, Ross. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Great presentation. Um, yeah, Chair, our next item is 5C, our annual election of officers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll just introduce that process. Um, you all probably know it better than I do. Um, so the chair will open for nominations. First, uh, we conduct the process for chair, and then second, we conduct the process for vice chair. 
Um, so the chair will open the floor for nominations. Um, each nomination does require a second. Um, after the floor is closed for nominations, then we will hold a, a vote, um, a, a not a paper ballot. So for that portion of it, we will have a, a Janet call roll on those votes. Um, and then once we elect the chair, then we'll move on to a vice chair for this evening. So um, that's all I had on that uh, okay. timeline, which is in your packet. Okay, do you want me to go ahead? Okay, then I'll open the floor for uh, nominations for uh, chairperson. Uh, this is Eileen. I'd like to nominate Rick for re-election to chair. Um, as we all know, we've, I think we had one meeting maybe before the pandemic hit. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some plans to work on alternative funding where uh, the brakes were put on pretty hard. But I really, uh, I feel Rick has done a great job working with Perry and the golf course um uh, it's been a real win for the, the department and the city how we were able to get that place open and keep that revenue going when we had to close almost everything else down um it was uh beautifully executed and i know that rick played an important part in that uh with staff on, on keeping that going so um i nominate uh, rick to be reelected for another year i'd second it I think the process to ask other nominations. Hearing none, we'll have Janet do the roll call. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Darlene? Aye. Commissioner Dosach? Aye. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Strother? Aye. Commissioner Willett? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Aye. I will open the floor for nominations for vice chairperson, please. I'd like to nominate uh, Eileen McCauley. I think uh, um, Eileen's done uh, a good job helping me, certainly. But um, I think, as she said, uh, I think uh, we're looking forward to ending this year, this calendar year, on a better note. So I'd like to nominate her for vice uh, chairperson. Back at that. Any other nominations? I'll have Janet do the roll call, please. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Dalheim? Aye. Commissioner Dostatch? Aye. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Stetter? Aye. Commissioner Willett? Aye. Commissioner Itis? Hi. Gary, um, yeah, I think that takes care of everything there. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners, um, for that process. The uh, next item up on your agenda is the uh, Chair and Member Comments. I just did something different because of our agenda this evening and put the work plan update in the chair and member comments considering there's no action we need from you tonight so if you did want to provide any updates to the work plan we could take those during this process as well in addition to any uh, comments that members may have uh, as part of the regular agenda so i don't know if there are any work plan items we wanted to, uh, to handle at first yeah Chair, I'd have one to offer up. This is actually uh, from our January meeting. Our team noted on our 2020 work plan, item number seven, we were going to meet again as a team and wrap that one up. So uh, Mike and Tom and Perry and I uh, got together uh, on a quick call yesterday 
uh, just to wrap up some inputs on work item number seven of uh, last year. So just to give the rest of the commission a sense for that, we, you know, the initiative again was study and report on the strategic goal of 15% of Edina land dedicated to parks and green spaces. Uh, we obviously want to maintain that. We checked uh, on our current uh, progress against that, and uh, we're at 15.5%, 15.5% with parks and natural resource areas included. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, been accomplished, and we plan to maintain that. We then also kicked around some ideas of additional strategic and operational goals uh, that would be worthwhile and would apply to both our strategic plan and our comprehensive plan. And so came up with a, a list of those that we're going to start to uh, consider going forward. And I think that will actually roll nicely into a work item that we have for 2021. So I won't go into more de detail on that uh, today, but that should be available uh, um, in a in a recap and we'll see more of it in our work plans for the upcoming year but just wanted to update the commission that we did finish that one off and uh, we'll have some uh, direction on uh, additional metrics beyond just the 15 percent of our acreages park space I don't have an update. This is uh, Commissioner Strother on anything related to the work plan, but I did have a comment that I just wanted to make um, regarding whoever puts together the reactivity boxes, if that's how you say it. Um, but uh, for uh, those of us with kids who have been stuck inside um, with the cold weather, the, um, the work that went into um, trying to create some uh, organized activity while we're all stuck at home um, was really appreciated. I think my Oldest is probably a little too young for some of the activities, but we still had um, a lot of fun with them. And I just wanted to mention how much I appreciated that creativity and uh, the the thought that clearly went into planning those um, and trying to put together some activities that would uh, challenge our our kit, but also work for some young kids too. It was um, well done. Thank you, Commissioner Struthers. That is. Uh, Tracy's team, Amanda Clark, Tiffany Bushland, Nicole Gorman, they've been doing a fantastic job on those. Yeah, I would say also the Yeti thing. We, me and my kids did that. We were very unsuccessful, but we did good out there and it was a good excuse to um, go out on, on some really cold days. I would love to do it when it's not quite as cold as well, but it was really a fun like activity. Um, just even do, like, it was just, I mean, some of the cool thing was the Yeti part, but it was just a fun scavenger hunt to go through the city and, you know, it was fun to challenge my park knowledge and make sure I got the, the, all the quizzes correctly. So it was fun. So thanks to them for all the, I mean, there's been a lot of really creative things that have come out. So I think it's been really great. No bonbons have been set, set around eating to this, this group. That's a great movie. I just uh, I just want to thank everybody on staff and the commission for um, you know coming through a difficult year. Everybody just hung in there, um, especially staff, and really did everything they could uh, to keep everybody in the city uh, having a positive attitude about the parks. And um, you know we did the best we could with these remote meetings and and trying to move things forward. And I think Perry and his staff have done a, a great job. There's a lot of unsung heroes in the department, so I will be sure to let them know, but I appreciate your comments. Uh, I just had one comment, Director, of um, appreciation to the staff for keeping paths open, um, you know, almost immediately so people can continue to use them. So I'm at Pamela Park, and it's always clear and always <laughs> Gives me the opportunity to walk at lunch or sometime in the afternoon and get out of the house. So much appreciated to the staff and getting those paths cleared. Um, I have one. Thank you. Uh, I don't think Greg could probably see the lights down at the ice rink, but I can see them at 430 in the morning. So I'd like to thank the, thank the person that keeps the ice very nice at Lewis. Just if you could just do it about a half hour later, it'd be nice. <laughs> anyway. It's your wake-up call each morning, huh? 
Wow, it's it's bright. It, our bedroom is on the north side, and when he flicks those lights, it's it's a uh, it's a bright awakening. Yeah, that and, drink gets uh, everybody does it. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's nice to hear the sound, the click click, and not being a skater, so it's it's a nice sound. But you could just I agree with everybody. I, go ahead. You could just get over to the golf dome earlier, Rick. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Special key to yeah. get in. I, yeah, I mentioned to uh, Perry earlier tonight. Uh, Saturday, I think there were twenty-eight cars parked on the road, in addition to the lot being full. So, yet uh, I think you know they're doing a very good job over there, safety-wise. I mean, when they opened up, you know, earlier in the year they were side by side or vacant. Uh, every other stall was vacant, but now they've gone full in. And uh, I think they're doing a great job. I know I'm I'm over there a lot, and you know the staff when you leave right away, they're just the cleanliness and and uh, the traffic flow has just been uh, been very good, very good this year. So it's nice to see it open, boy. It um, that is uh, that's a good thing for the city to have. Um, now, didn't, there was a comment. I don't know if everybody read it, and I think in Perry's material that um, we had the number one 2020 uh, top tracer. I think of all their locations, I think there were like 52,000 people that played at our dome in 2020. So mm -hmm. um, in spite of all the uh, circumstances. So um, uh, just a great, uh, all the staff in Edina, I mean, uh, the more people I meet, it just everything up and down is just doing a great job under this. Thank you for all those comments, especially on the, you know, the rinks and the trails. I think that's often yeah. um, not observed. And I'll put Tom on the spot because that is his staff. Maybe he wants to just describe what a what a typical day looks like. And um, I believe the staff had their first day off this Sunday since mid-December, roughly. So, yeah, the the guys really put in. Ex extraordinary efforts for the rinks and trails in Edina. So, uh, Rick, to your point, the uh, the lights coming on at 4.30. So the guys, seven days a week, uh, we're starting at four in the morning to get the rinks ready yeah. for use when they're making the base. Now it should wow. be closer to 5.30 for you. So now they're doing seven days a week okay. at a 5 a.m. start. <laughs> but I'll tell my guys, <laughs> that There's no other city that puts in the effort uh like Edina does for the hockey rink open skating rinks and the trails so yeah. uh incredible incredible effort yeah. for the I, residents i know i have uh my three grandchildren live in minnetonka but they come over and use our rinks uh they always say even at seven years old they say the ice is the best grandpa you know so i guess that means the ice is the best perry's always telling me that they're so much better in Edina than minnetonka so that's good good to hear It was uh, just as a quick aside there, that was also one of the metrics that we identified too. And I think our current uh, measure is we have one outdoor sheet for every 4,400 residents in Edina. So we have uh, wow. lots of lots of ice rinks available during the winter. And they're for all ages. I think that's the important thing is that, yep. you know, certainly when I go across the street and you know, go for my walk around the park. Uh, you know, it's just all ages, which is nice to see. I mean, that's uh, uh, just a, a great indication of, of uh, our community, I think, to see that happen. Yeah, the flooded areas that are next to many of the rinks, as you say, are a great spot for right. beginning skaters yep. or older skaters that don't want to be out in a rink anymore. Right. I'll sign up for that. <laughs> and I think, you know, to Tom and his staff's credit as well, as they did add two locations well for just general rinks this year due to COVID. We knew outdoor activities would be busy. So we did um, add a, just a general rink over at Yancey Park and down at Wooddale Park as well, um, which are being used heavily as well. So um, we, we knew they would be busy. We knew it would be a busy winter. People want something to do. So we're um, good credit to staff in that sense as well. It's not just their dedication but that creativity to expand. 
-hmm. Yeah, there was a bunch of comments on next door when they were flooding the Yancey Park one, like, what's going on over there? So uh, it was, I'm sure it was appreciated once uh, some people chimed in that it was for skating. Uh, Perry, I have one question. How, the plans for the, the swimming pool, how are those going? Well, as you know, it was a, a sad year last year. We did not open the uh, aquatic center um, due to COVID restrictions. Um, our plan for this summer is to reopen. Um, we think we have enough experience from um, other entities, um, not a lot that are in Minnesota, but just other entities across the nation that have shared some of their prevention and plans. Um, we are recruiting lifeguards, recruiting staff. It's our intent to open. Obviously, the restrictions around the pandemic will dictate what it actually looks like. So um, we expect there to be occupancy limits. We expect there to be social distancing guidelines. We expect there to be masking requirements in the common area, but not in the pool. Um, it's going to all depend on what the guidance is on how it looks like for us to operate. So we are going to try to be nimble. Um, we do plan on selling season passes. However, we do know that we may have to switch last minute to go to reservations and a daily fee. So um, we're going to try to just keep continuing to be um, flexible and dynamic right up until we open, which traditionally would be kind of that early part of June towards that uh, mid to late portion of August. So um, our plan is to open this summer. However, it may look different than it has in the past. Hopefully people will be used to um, changes and different accommodations after um, working through this the last, uh, you know, almost coming up on, on a year here soon. So, um, but our plan is to be open. Thank you. Any other comments or we can move to staff comments, I guess. I kind of asked for a staff comment first, but we can move to the staff comments then. Sure, Chair and Commissioner, just a Anything. couple of quick updates in your packet this evening. I'll just highlight them. Um, for those of you that aren't the uh, parent or guardian of someone in Edina Hockey or in figure skating or using Bramer Arena, there is a live stream option now. We did kind of update you on that agreement um, in the past of what that was going to be, but that is up and running. Um, obviously, the golf dome has been very busy, but we've also done additional programming at the golf course. Um, we've done a few full moon uh, snowshoe events. And in addition, um, we've got a couple of uh, days left where you can rent snowshoes from the golf course. You can either snowshoe at the course or you can take them to a nearby park or property or state park with you. So we've got those options there. Um, let's see, just a couple other things that are going on. Right now. obviously, in addition to the reactivity boxes, we also have the best in snow contest. Again, um, submit your best in snow. Um, piece of that. And then we are, uh, um, again, recruiting for summer employment, all the activities that you talk about, um, that we discuss that people enjoy, it takes a lot of staff to operate. So um, if folks are out there right now looking for summer jobs, um, they can go to the city's website, edinamn.gov, and it's backslash summer jobs. So um, hopefully something for everyone there. And I did include um, the... Uh, What's the minimum age for a job with the city for the summer? It, um, it does vary. Our minimum, uh, our certain minimum of 16. Some positions require a higher age of 18. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and in addition, the uh, uh, local option sales tax proposal that we've talked about um, last year as one of the methods of alternate funding, the city council did um, update a revised resolution and that um, request is with the state legislature. So um, that is just the first step in a multi-long process. However, it is um, active again for the 2021 legislative session. And then just the last quick item for those um, that uh, want to make sure we get this date in front of everyone. Uh, noon on Wednesday, February 17th, coming up quick is our opening of uh, registration for our spring and summer activities. Um, you can preview that directory now. 
Um, the one thing that does help staff and it does help our patrons is if um, people go in and they do make sure that their account details are updated in advance. So um, check on your password, check on your household members, ensure your ages are up to date. All those little details help registration go so, so, so much smoother for us, but obviously the user as well. Uh, some classes are very busy, so you want to make sure that you're credentialed and open and your account is active so there aren't any issues with you getting into some of the busier sessions. So, um, And then I would be remiss if I didn't uh, point out one thing. He he hasn't said anything about it, so I don't want to put him on a huge spot. But I want to thank Commissioner Darlene. Um, his, his last evening with us as commissioner, he's not re-upped. Um, so his tenure is done with us. But I did want to thank him uh, from the staff um, for all of his work over the years. Um, just a great appreciation from our team for his support and acceptance of us new members. So I just wanted a, a couple of quick things during his tenure and I, I wish I'd done this for Commissioner McCormick as well, but um, a lot of overlap. During um, Commissioner Darlene's tenure, he was part of the uh, Weber Woods um, conversation. Um, he was on the commission when that occurred. The city acquired almost 10 acres from the city of Minneapolis. Um, he was uh, commissioner during the Braemar Golf Course reconstruction, the master plan for Fred Richards Park, master plan for Braemar Park, master plan for Arden Park and its implementation, uh, new playground equipment for Roslyn Park and Weber Park, um, improvements to the Aquatic Center zero depth play structure, uh, the new bridges replacements at Centennial Lake Park, um, the pickleball complex, the Moody Courts at Roslyn Park, improvements in Courtney Fields, uh, the approval of the Tranquility Garden to go in Arnes and Acres Park. Um, he was here for the Top Tracer addition to the Golf Dome. And I think one of the, the things that he led as his work group was the, uh, the recommendation to rename Garden Park um, to Yancey Park after BC and Ellen Yancey. So um, thank you for his service and his tenure. And as he and I have talked, um, um, he will uh, always be a, a resource for us to support, and we're grateful for that. So thank you, Commissioner Nellie. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, um, thank you, Perry. Uh, I didn't have a lot to do with a lot of those things. I just happened to be on the commission when they occurred, so I appreciate uh, pointing that out to this whole staff of folks because they're all as instrumental and some probably more so than myself in some of those things. So. Um, I don't necessarily take any of the credit for that, but glad to be a part of some of the discussions. Um, it is an honor to serve the community. Um, as I told you on Friday, I grew up here and I've said that multiple times in these meetings. So um, it's a passion of mine, the park. So I will still be interested and supportive and always a resource to anyone that they've got questions. Um, it's just, um, it uh, won't be serving in an official capacity. I'll just be a regular resident using the regular modes of curiosity about when things are going to get fixed that we we see nowadays so but um, I thank you for the opportunity um, uh, and I want to say huh, thanks to Janet she gave me my first paycheck for the 15 year old to the parks and rec so I care about her very much and I miss, remember that. Miss her great but, <laughs> Keep, keep us honest on the rectangular fields, will you, Matt? I'm afraid they're going to stop us without your uh, watching us on those. Yeah, unfortunately, in my house, uh, she's almost too old for those now. So uh, <laughs> my, my my son is my son likes baseball, so a little bit different shaped. But uh, oh, yeah, okay. I think I think I think multi-use rectangular fields, however we can find them and and use them. I think uh, anytime we can give kids and and adults, for that matter, opportunities to get outside. If we've learned anything from the pandemic, we need to continue to, to I told Perry on Friday, um, the two things most people, when they think of you down, I think of schools and think of parks. So um, schools, I don't have a lot of influence on because I'm past that part, except for my wife teaching in the district. But um, the parks, I think, are so valuable to every single community person, regardless of what your interest may be. Uh, if it's simply just walking or if it's actually doing some of the activities we offer. So um, I'll watch closely and hope you guys are able to get the funding that you so desperately need in 2021 and beyond to make an impact on 
things that we want to do at Braemar and Fred Richards and some of those places, because I think we've got a, an opportunity to really change things for the better and, and respond to the things that people are asking us to do. So I wish you all best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. We better, start, we better start paying attention to Courtney Fields and Van Valkenburg because yeah. uh, Matt's yeah. going to be all over us on those. Oh. My email would appreciate it, right? <laughs> we don't want to get that email inbox flooded. But as as we've kind of learned, you know, we often have to take a very analytical and quantitative approach to a lot of the things we do. Um, but as Commissioner Darlene always reminds me, there's this real qualitative piece of it. You know, when he describes his his first job being with the city of Edina and Park and Rec and where his kids learn to ride their bikes, et cetera. There's this real qualitative piece that we also can't overlook. So I really appreciate his perspective and grounding me in a lot of those efforts. So um, with that, Chair Itis, um, your upcoming, your next upcoming meeting is March 9th. Um, and I have no other updates for the commission this evening. Okay. Um, anybody else have comments? If not, I'll ask for the motion for adjournment and a second. So moved. Second. It's up to you, Janet. Commissioner McCauley? Aye. Commissioner Darlene? Aye. Commissioner Dostat? Aye. Commissioner Good? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Struthers? Aye. Commissioner Willett? Aye. Commissioner Ida? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Stay warm. Thank you.